Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I am really excited about the opportunity here to share with you a little bit about my background, a little bit about our vision uh, here at Ionis and how, how that's evolving. And um, to share with you some of the new areas of research and uh, that I'm involved in. And really the, the focus today in heart disease and CNS complications, uh, those two therapeutic areas being kind of where we, where we live today, um, day in and day out, with a focus on patients that are uh, in, in need of, of therapy. Um, my disclosures, got it. I, I was told I had to put this up. I think it's kind of obvious. <laughs> I have been at, at Ionis for almost 30 years now. And uh, the, the track was uh, fairly rapid in the early days and there was a lot happening and there were ups and downs. And uh, I can certainly speak to uh, the biotech industry and how, uh, how mm, bumpy it can be at times and how much you can also learn in such a position. Today, um, I'm Chief Development Officer at IONIS. I'm responsible for moving nucleic acid um, molecules from bench to bedside. Uh, ultimately, for those that we choose to keep, uh, moving them to market approval. So all of this starts with manufacturing. And I think that's uh, kind of interesting in that uh, almost immediately upon uh, getting a molecule from research, uh, we have to scale that thing up. And generally we scale it up to cover uh, all of our tox work plus all of the early initial up to POC or proof of concept uh, in the clinic. So it starts with manufacturing. Within six months, we move the product into animal toxicology. And generally, 12 to 18 months uh, from the time that the molecule comes over from research and is approved, uh, it moves into a patient. In my role as oversight, I participate in two governance committees. Uh, one of them is the Research Management Committee uh, and the other is development management. So it's kind of kind of obvious, but research brings the molecule and all the data that supports the next step. And then it moves into development and development committee uh, approves the development path for the molecule. Are we going to keep it? Are we going to take it to POC? Are we uh, going with all the way? Are we going to... Um, move it to a partner. So the research team brings the candidates and development management makes the high level decisions on regard to what happens to that molecule in development. Hope that's clear as mud. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about chemistry today. And chemistry is, is really the key uh, to these molecules uh, being biological, pharmacologically drug-like in their, in their uh, ability to reach their target. So it both is uh, in um, today, we're actually um, in all of our programs competing SIs and ASOs from the get-go uh, at the bench, as well as conjugated versus unconjugated. In many cases, we know that we need a conjugation, particularly if we're targeting liver, all the liver uh, molecules are Galnac conjugated. And then if it's going outside the liver, again, another moiety is needed. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, we'll talk a little bit about these conjugates and what we're doing there. I think the diversification of the attributes, ultimately, uh, the goal 
is to bring forward the best in class molecules. Uh, we're always tackling difficult unmet medical needs. So even then, um, when we get them to the, to the point of taking them into development, uh, we need to prioritize. And so that's another piece of uh, my responsibilities is prioritizing the portfolio with a lot of help from uh, my colleagues in, in uh, global commercial, et cetera. Okay, so the, the idea is to find a way to get these molecules uh, moving. If they deserve to be developed, we either find a partner or we do it ourselves. We don't want to leave anything on the shelf. And that's pretty much the, uh, the goal of everything we do. So a little bit about chemistry here on this slide. We've really uh, tackled pretty much every, every part of the nucleic acid molecule, whether it's the backbone, conjugates, sugar modifications, um, and one base modification that still is quite, um, um, quite apparent in all of our molecules. So what are the chemistries? Of course, there are the conjugates like Galnac, and that's shown in the upper left hand. Newer backbone modifications down in the lower left hand. The newer one is like mesol that preserves RNA-SH1 activity and uh, very nicely prolongs half-lives beyond the simple phosphorothioates. The sugar modifications improve affinity and stability. And as far as I know, the methyl cytosine modification to the cytosine base is the only base modification in our MedChem toolbox intended to reduce pro-inflammatory sequence-related issues. Finally, I would say on the right-hand side, um, I'll pop it up here. You'll see the chimeric Gapmer structure that we use for all of our RNAs H1 targeted ASOs. I don't have on here the fully modified uh, chemistry, chemistry construct that is being used for splice, uh, either splice altering uh, inclusion or exclusion. While this slide is not exhaustive in all of its flavors, uh, I think it gives you a good sense um, of the molecules that we're using and selecting to put into uh, a given SAR for a given, for a given target. The SAR uh, effort generally takes a year to get through literally thousands of designs um, and then some preclinical work that's done before a molecule comes to RMC for um, a proposal to take it into development. Speaking of the conjugates beyond Galnac, which is shown as one of the examples of the carbohydrate um, conjugate, um, today we're exploring also other modalities like the peptides, um, which are looking very promising in, in some really interesting areas like blood-brain barrier uh, and muscle antibodies and fab fractions and the bicycle peptides. I'll talk a little bit more about the bicycles uh, because they're, they're kind of unique. They're essentially small molecules. They're uh, cyclic peptides, which um, can be uh, identified to bind very strongly and selectively to certain uh, molecules that are that are able to uh, bring in molecules into cells. So there are many others in research stage, but these are the ones that are uh, public and they're the ones that are really uh, the most used in our research programs. You'll notice also on that last slide, sorry, go back for a minute, that we're targeting delivery with these conjugates, both for ASOs and siRNA. All right, so the um, 
Lyca, what we call Lyca, ligand conjugated antisense, also the siRNA, uh, are being delivered to hepatocytes utilizing the GALNAC uh, chemistry, these n s galactosamine conjugates. Um, result in, you can see on the left-hand side, how they enter uh, the cells. Ultimately, that results in increased potency. And so what you can see on the right-hand side is what that looks like when we compare in, in man, in human beings, what the, what the dose response looks like unconjugated versus conjugated. And there's a very nice leftward shift that generally uh, demonstrates 20 to 30 fold increase in potency in man. So the bicycle technology, uh, these are constrained peptides. We utilize a phage display to further optimize binding uh, as shown in the cartoons here. Uh, and what we're really focused on right now is the transferrin uh, receptor. Transferrin receptor in muscle, both um, skeletal muscle as well as cardiomyocyte and beyond, and then including exploration of the blood-brain barrier. So once we've identified then um, a high affinity uh, structure, we then conjugate that to our oligonucleotides and begin to do the SAR on the oligos themselves. Talk a little bit about safety database. This is uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, we have a very large and growing database. This is just looking at the GALNAC uh, database that we've uh, constructed. I, we started this back in about 2010, building the database we've published uh, on our phase one and then phase two um, databases. And today we have more than 6,000 uh, subjects that have been admin administered an oligo with the GALNAC conjugate, with almost 5,000 that have been on the drug for at least six months, most of them for more than a year. So the Safety profile is holding up. It's a very um, exciting time for uh, these molecules in this, this particular platform. The safety margins are markedly improved. And we're talking about going from three to tenfold, now going to nearly a hundredfold. So four liver targeted uh, GALNAC ASOs have advanced into phase three. We'll talk about some of these. One, our first uh, GALNAC conjugated ASO was uh, approved by FDA just a few months ago, right before Christmas. Nice little Christmas gift for us. All right, so heart disease uh, remains a very high priority for us. So number one cause of death globally, I think most of you are aware of this, principle uh, for us is a strategic pipeline with multiple targets uh, for complex disease. So RNA targeting uniquely positioned, I think, to tackle this goal and um, to provide multiple tools for the physicians facing this fatal outcome in many of their patients. All of this, with the one ultimate goal of saving lives. So what does the uh, cardiology franchise look like today? <clears throat> a, num a number of these molecules are being developed by our uh, partners, um, but I'm gonna talk about two that we're <clears throat> independently uh, developing, eplantercin and olisarsin. Uh, we'll talk about those today. So starting with severely elevated triglycerides, and I think this is a this is an area that is not fully, um, I think, really understood. But we're we're further focusing this on a rare population known as familial comicronemia. 
syndrome, FCS. Uh, at the top of this, pyra this pyramid uh, are the most severe, rare, LPL lipase deficient, sometimes missing completely, familial common micronemia patients. So this is a genetic disease. Um, there are places in, in the country, including uh, Eastern Canada, and as, as well as Northeastern United States. Uh, today, it's an estimated population of about 500 patients in the US. So ultra rare, uh, represents another million patients um, for SHTG. That's the next level down, greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter. Um, it's another million patients without an identified LPL lipase mutation, but certainly some uh, impact from unknown sources on the clearance of triglycerides. In these two populations, sometimes uh, fatal acute pancreatitis attacks are, the, the attacks themselves are common, the fatality of them uh, is, is a sometimes event but it's certainly uh, where uh, the, main, uh, the main danger is. So there's a lot more information on this slide. I'm not gonna go through all of the word wall here, but um, we're, we're practicing in familial and very severe and severe. So all three of these uh, panels, um, and I'll talk, talk a little bit about the uh, programs. So in phase two, olisarsen, which is a Galnac conjugated antisense oligonucleotide, it's actually the same sequence as Weylivra. Weylivra is the first APOC3 targeted antisense, but unconjugated, uh, currently approved in the uh, European Union but not in the United States. So in a dose ranging study with our GALNAC, uh, we were able to show that very low doses, um, dosed weekly or monthly, um, were able to lower the, the, the uh, triglyceride levels. And it works in this way. Olisarsen targets APOC3. APOC3 is a peptide that is bound to a lot of the lipid particles in the blood. It's a biochemical break on LPL, uh, the LPL enzyme, right? That's the lipase clearing enzyme for triglycerides. So high levels of APOC3 result in an ever increasing level of triglycerides because it's basically blocking the activity of the enzyme to clear. Hope that makes sense. And in this phase two dose ranging study, we showed that by silencing APOC3, more than 90% of the patients were able to bring their triglyceride levels to normal. These were, uh, you know, lifetime high triglyceride patients. And the result of the phase two work then supported uh, our uh, additional work to move this into registration trials. So just one other slide that I think is interesting, it's kind of gives you a broad look at the lipid profile, gives you a sense of how lipids in circulation were modulated with olisarsen treatment, including multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease, but also increasing HDL and APOA1 potentially beneficial lipids. So ultimately showing broad improvement in the lipid profile. The non-HDL, uh, LDLC, ApoB, uh, these are all uh, risk factors, VLDL, and combined um, form that um, uh, additional cardiovascular risk factor that today is not well controlled. So familial comicronemia, patients at risk of potentially fatal acute pancreatitis attacks 
Almost all of these patients have a history of pancreatitis. It's caused by the loss of function, I told you, of the lipase, and then results in average triglyceride levels that are greater than a gram per deciliter. If you can imagine the, the plasma for these patients, if you take a blood sample, uh, the blood doesn't is not red, it's pink. And if you spin out the plasma, the plasma is white. It's like milk. That's how high the triglycerides are. So the target of olisarsen is to take APOC3 out. And you might ask the question, well, how does it work if they don't have lipase to begin with? And the answer to that, it took us a few years to figure this one out, but the biology is very interesting. When you don't have lipase, you have to have something that's controlling uh, your triglycerides, maybe not well, but controlling them. And it's through, uh, it's actually through the liver and the liver taking triglycerides out of circulation uh, through a number of receptors, important receptors, that APOC3 is once again a break um, on that clearance mechanism. So when you take APOC3 down, while you're not releasing lipase to clear, you're releasing the liver to clear those triglycerides. The second question that you might ask is, well, if you do that, do you run into steatotic livers? Are you increasing the triglyceride levels in the liver? Interestingly, uh, in three, I guess four now studies where we've looked at MRIs and liver fat, um, it actually goes down. Uh, not well understood, uh, still being investigated, but apparently the clearance pathway um, takes the triglycerides into the liver and digests those. And they don't result in a, in a increase in triglycerides in the liver. So with all of that exciting news, we initiated phase three in 2021, um, and then a one-year readout uh, for a successful phase three in FCS with a few surprises. One-year readout was in tw late 2023, just last year. The, the study that was designed by uh, our clinical group and approved by our DMC looked like this. So we had two doses, 50 and 80 milligrams, given once monthly versus a placebo group. The randomization was interesting. It was really um, a two to one, that's a or one to one to one, that is 22. 50 milligram, 22, 80 milligram, and 22 placebo. That was the uh, that was the idea. We ended up with 66 patients uh, in this study, which uh, once again was one of the largest uh, the largest trials ever run in this patient population. They all had fasting triglycerides greater than 80 to 80. And that you might ask, well, what's what's that 80 to 80? In Europe, uh, the level 10 millimole per liter is, is kind of the guidance for chylomicronemia, and that translates to about 8 80 milligram per deciliter. So fasting triglycerides need to be higher than that, and they needed to have a history of pancreatitis. Um, in addition to that, we had um, uh, patients were expected to be on background lipid lowering therapy. So standard of care um, and stable standard of care needed to be in place for all of these patients. Nevertheless, they remained um, out, of, uh, out of control in their triglycerides. So <laughs> late last year, we um, press released a positive primary and key secondary for this trial, uh, including marked reductions in acute pancreatitis, which was one of the surprises. I mean, it was a huge surprise because of the, the magnitude of that, that reduction. The next steps are presenting the full results at the American Academy of Cardiology, which is coming up in just a few weeks. So the team is really excited to be able to get out to, uh, to the meeting in Atlanta 
and present this work. We received the orphan drug in the US and EU on this product and were just recently awarded breakthrough. And I, for those of you that are familiar with uh, the FDA's processes, it is, it is not easy to get breakthrough uh, with the FDA. It means that you get a lot more attention from uh, senior management as well as the division in helping you get through uh, your filings and compiling your NDA properly. And uh, we've certainly got uh, a lot of interactions with uh, FDA uh, with all of this, including uh, even early negotiation on what, uh, what a label might look like. So the first independent commercial launch for IONIS is this molecule, NFCS. We're expecting to independently launch in the US uh, this year if approved. And I say this year, it, it really is dependent on priority uh, review. And we're hoping that the breakthrough helps us uh, with that. All right, so I mentioned at the beginning, cardiology and neurology are, um, are uh, specific focuses therapeutically. So I'm gonna turn your attention now to neurology. Um, this really is a validated franchise now with three drugs approved. Um, Spinraza, Calsati, and Wainua was approved uh, in December, just right at the tail end. Told you that little Christmas gift that we received. Three approved medicines, 11 medicines in clinical development that are shown uh, here, and then uh, wholly owned medicines in clinical development um, six of them by the end of this year. So we hope to move four additional wholly owned. That, that means that we intend to develop them all the way through phase three and commercialize. So I wanna talk a little bit about TTR amyloidosis as it affects polyneuropathy. Um, this is one of our unique sub-Q administered um, TTR neurodrugs, you can see on the right-hand side, uh, peripheral neuropathy impacts multiple organs and tissues, and the disease is systemic, it's progressive, and it's fatal. There are about 40,000 patients with the polyneuropathy form alone, and if you expand that to the cardio, which is the other interesting thing about this molecule, it's actually both a neuro and a cardiac focus. So that's shown here, polyneuropathy in the orange and in the whatever that color is, purplish, uh, it's cardiomyopathy in the heart. So the development program that we're running addresses the major uh, unmet needs in all ATTR amyloidosis patients. The polyneuropathy now is approved. The cardiomyopathy trial, which is an outcome trial, is ongoing. A little bit about chemistry. So what is the new molecule? What does the new molecule, eplon tercin, look like compared to uh, the unconjugated original? You can see here that in a tercin, which is on the bottom, is shown at the bottom of the slide, 420915, is approved in the US and EU for PN and multiple countries beyond. Um, and the sequence is identical, right? Eplon tercin is modified as follows. First, you've got the Galnac on the five prime end, and the Galnac uh, conjugate, and then second with the backbone modifications reducing the phosphorothioate content uh, while utilizing the identical sequence. So you can see where the phosphodiesters are. Those are the little black circles with the P, and they're embedded in the wings of the molecule where the 2 prime methoxyethyl protects the molecule from being degraded. The gap where 
uh, degradation occurs with the endonucleases are all phosphothioate. Today, we're starting to sprinkle in our measles in the, uh, in the gap. And what the measles do uh, is give us the opportunity to expand even beyond the once monthly dosing. Takes you out to quarterly and possibly even every six month dosing. But today, Olisa, no, sorry, Eplon Tersen, shown here, is the same sequence as Inatersen, but with these modifications. And you can also see that the cytosines are methylated. All right, which is the, it's similar between both molecules. So this is the study design. This was a study design we took to the um, regulators and uh, the regulators agreed that this would be possible. We utilized an external placebo control from our previous inotersin work, 60 patients on um, placebo. And in this trial, uh, everybody got drug. 144 got eflantersin, 24 received uh, inotersin or Tegseti, which is the approved product. So we had a head-to-head -head with the current uh, approved product for um, the first 35 weeks. And then at 35 weeks, everybody on inotersin was then moved over to eplantersin. And uh, there was an, another evaluation at 66 and 85 weeks. At 35, which is what we actually filed on, 35-week interim analysis, the co-primary was highly statistically significant, and I'll show you some of that data. The percent change from baseline for TTR and an MNIST plus seven, which is a clinical me measurement of neuropathy, change from baseline, and then a key secondary efficacy endpoint, Norfolk quality of life. So, Eplantersen, then the first co primary of reduced TTR is shown here, but highly statistically significant compared to the historical placebo group, which is in orange above. The effect was strong at the interim and was sustained all the way through week 85. And this was with, again, once monthly dosing, and the dose was 45 milligrams. So eflantersin continued to halt neuropathy as well. The second co-primary, MNIST plus seven, a medical assessment of neuropathy, exhibited improvement in a majority of the patients. Um, further, uh, we were pleased that the analysis of the impotent showed consistency across pre-specified subgroups, males, females, um, um, geographic uh, components, uh, et cetera, and across all components of the measure. So ultimately, Eplantersen continued to halt the progression of neuropathy, um, ultimately through 85 weeks. Then if you look at quality of life, which was a key secondary at week 35, and then a key um, uh, co-primary, at the later time points. Even more dramatic was the overwhelming majority of patients exhibiting a reversal in the inexorable negative progression of these patients' quality of life. And the consistency of the reversal across subgroups again, and with the quality of life subdomains. So with all of this exciting data, uh, at the time of filing, we had th week 35. We continued to accumulate uh, at week 66 and 85. Today, we have a product that is approved, and we have a partner in AstraZeneca who is helping us with the commercialization of this product, co-commercialization co in the U.S., and they are taking on independently the rest of the world. There were no severe uh, adverse events. Uh, so this just shows you the, uh, the nice uh, profile that these Galnec compounds have. 
nothing, no severe adverse, adverse events associated with F1 person treatment and overall balanced safety profile over time. In the end, supporting a very nice um, approval and label. And so this is what the product looks like. It's, an, it's a self-administered um, auto injector. Uh, the trade name was given as Wainua. That's why you got Wainua up there, but you can see in parentheses at Blunterson. Importantly, this sub-Q medicine is administered with the auto injector in which patients either self-administer or they get help from their caregiver, but the treatment is once monthly themselves at home. All right, now I'm going to turn to intrathecal administration. Uh, how are we doing? I need to finish this up. So ASO distribution in the rat following systemic sub-Q or IV is shown at the top, and the drug does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So with IT administration directly into the CSF, you can see how quickly uh, the drug distributes, in this case in a rat, following IT administration to the rest of the CNS. With some, uh, some of the drug then um, coming out into circulation and you can see it in the kidneys and that's pretty much all you see in these, um, yeah, these images. So as we now have nearly 10 years experience in development of ASOs administered directly into the CSF, we continue to pioneer advances in the technology and development that optimize this delivery approach. And that has validated both splicing and RNA-SH mechanisms in the CNS of patients and established now the potential for long dosing intervals. I'll show you some of that data. In clinical development, lessons learned are being implemented in creative trial designs, addressing the challenges of disease modifying um, medicines in development. It's not enough time to go through all of that, but I did want to talk to you a little bit about MAPT, the gene that encodes tau protein, um, and our approach looking in uh, at cognitive decline, which correlates very well with tau pathology. The mutations in the MAPT also cause a rare form of frontotemporal dementia. So one of the things that I wanted to show you here is that we've optimized screening paradigms to identify number one, highly potent ASOs. So this is just a comparison to some of our earlier work with SOD1 and our later work now with um, our partnered with Biogen uh, tau uh, oligonucleotide. The most exa advanced example, I think, of a highly potent ASO with a long duration of action. In the mouse, you can see on the right-hand side, the duration was uh, three months, pretty flat. For, uh, for the MAPT oligo, which is in that uh, kind of bluish color. This improved duration of action has now translated from preclinical models to patients. Uh, in the early phase one work, which is shown here, you can see that once quarterly dosing uh, provides very robust blue line, this follow the blue line with the quarterly dosing reduction in tau protein in the CSF and a very long duration of action continues to, even after the second dose, continues to reduce out to 197 days and then out another uh, three to six months, depending on the patient. So favorable tolerability and safety profile, we then move this into a phase two study, uh, Biogen is managing. These are some of the images that came out of that phase 1B study where we were able to show um, a reduction in the tau protein in the brain. And this using tau pat or positron emission tomography to look at uh, the reduction and ultimately clearance of the tau protein in the brain. So this is evidence was was correlated with an evidence of improved cognition. 
So the team is really excited and and we move forward into a fairly large uh, so-called celia phase two study, which is underway in patients with early Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so I'm wrapping up. I wanna open it up for questions soon. So this is our current uh, phase three pipeline. Uh, we have nine medicines in phase three for 11 indications. It keeps us all busy and out of trouble. So uh, not shown today are the more than five medicines that will read out mid-stage studies that we hope will move many more uh, compounds into registrational studies in the years to come. So summary and conclusion. We think RNA therapeutics and broadly have the potential to reach new targets previously considered undruggable. I think that's, that's kind of the, the mantra and why many of you um, are looking at uh, a bright future in RNA therapeutics. The need is great. There are many at-risk patients that need help and the vision of potentially reaching the heart and the mind, which is a vision uh, that I have for our uh, development and commercialization group uh, is well on its way, I think. And innovation in delivering technologies, making significant progress, paving the way uh, for multiple oligonucleotide modalities, not just limited to antisense, not just limited to one um, conjugate or another, tackling unmet medical need uh, more broadly. So I wanna thank you all for your patience and uh, also wanna open it now to any questions that you may have at this time. Yes, thank you, uh, Richard, for this uh, great presentation. I think uh, I've learned a lot in the last uh, 45 minutes. So uh, if you have a question for uh, Richard, please use the Q&A function. Uh, and I will start with a few questions. So you're at IONIS for the last uh, 30 years. So in those 30 years, what was the biggest hurdle that you had to uh, overcome? And then the follow-up question is, what do you think that the biggest challenge is for the next five years? Well, it's almost the same answer. Okay. <laughs> so um, biggest challenge right from the beginning was delivery. When I joined the company, uh, we didn't know really anything about the pharmacokinetics, where are the drugs going, what cells are they getting into. So the first five years of my bench work here was, <laughs> You know, because I was hired in at a bench level scientist, um, was really tackling that question. And it was like the wild, wild west, right? We didn't even have the assays or the technology. So there was a lot to be done. Today we have the assays and technology and it, and it gets ever uh, more complex. Uh, we have opportunities even in... Um, non-invasive approach uh, to, to look in, in, in the patients themselves, as you saw with the, uh, with the brain imaging, with the PET scans uh, in Alzheimer's patients, it's still delivery. And, you know, are we delivering to the right cell? Are we delivering, you know, when we start thinking about new uh, areas of delivery like pulmonary, and there are, there are folks like at Arrowhead who are already working in pulmonary. Um, is there a difference in the way siRNA and ASOs deliver and which cells are optimal? And all of that is, uh, is open for exploration. Delivery and delivery. Okay, I, I I fully agree with uh, with that answer. That the delivery is the is the biggest challenge. And just coming back to a uh, part of your answer, so I think at the IONIS you do both the uh, siRNAs and the uh, ASOs. So can you uh, explain a little bit about the differences between those two uh, modalities? So differences in uh, efficacy, in the distribution profiles, uh, those kind of things. 
So a couple of high levels. Um, siRNA is predominantly uh, targeting the mature RNA in the cytoplasm, although there may there may be some indication that some nuclear activity is is still retained. So when we uh, pitch them at the same time, there's a couple of things we're looking for. One is delivery to the right cell. And second is potency. And some of that may have to do with uh, the actual uh, metabolism of and distribution of the RNA itself. Some RNAs are nuclear retained. Some RNAs, uh, most RNAs are expressed and ultimately uh, are, you know, mature RNAs. And the question is, which one is, is going to give you the biggest bang? There's one other piece to this, and that is duration of response. And I talked to you a little bit about uh, the measles, and we're looking at that in the ASOs, but also looking at it in siRNA. Is it possible to uh, prolong the siRNA even beyond uh, six months? Uh, I think there's some indication that that, that could be possible. And then uh, the same with, with the ASOs, are they going to be able to compete with a longer duration of action? Um, or how important, depending on the disease type, how important is that duration of, uh, of action? So there's, there's a lot of pieces that go into that. Um, I would say in vitro, siRNA often outcompetes uh, the ASO. In vivo, it doesn't always. And, and we think that has a lot to do with uh, pharmacokinetics and metabolism. Thank you. Uh, one more question from my side. So uh, uh, the other thing is, if we just focus on the ASOs purely, you have the splice modulating ASOs and the, and the GAPMERS. Um, and I always think, so is there a difference in getting these compounds uh, FDA approved? Because most of the time the GAPMERS are more complicated, you know, chemistry wise. Is there a difference in getting these FDA approved? Yeah. No, that's that's a really interesting question, Ron. And 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 I think it comes down to uh, CMC, right? Manufacturing. And so uh, while the GAPMERS are as you say, more complicated, at least they look more complicated. They're actually uh, easier to, to, to manufacture or as easy to manufacture as a fully modified ASO. So we haven't seen differences in uh, the ability to get through like CMC issues um, and ultimately, you know, deliver the compounds between those two um, approaches. So that's that's been the uh, experience so far. Thanks. So I'm moving to the Q&A. So we have quite a bit of questions. Um, so if you maybe keep the answers a bit short, then we can handle uh, more questions. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try to. Um, OK, so uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so for delivery, I think uh, I think because you mentioned that delivery is the the biggest hurdle, was and is the biggest hurdle. Um, uh, for with uh, so when you add a conjugate to the uh, to the compound, is the endosome still a hurdle for delivery? Is the only class. So the endosome is still a hurdle. Most of the most of the uptake mechanisms still, including Galnac including some of the peptides, um, are still taken up into endosomes through the receptors. Um, there, are, there are ways that we're looking at, it's very early in research, to understand whether there are things we can do um, with the conjugates to actually um, enhance escape from the endosome. But at this point, it's, it looks the same. Can you ask a question from uh, Sivam, so also about uh, endosomal escape. 
So uh, it seems to be a slight difference between the siRNAs and the ASO. So ASO is slightly better. Uh, so uh, what is IONIS doing towards this uh, particular challenge? Yeah, so it, we think that the siRNA is um, continuing to be released from the endosomes over time, and that's in part driving the long duration of action. And so um, one of the things that we're looking at with the ASO is to stabilize that gap for RNA-SH approaches. We can stabilize that gap and prolong the, the half-lives. We can also impact duration of action for the for the single strands. The double strands, it's already, it's already in place and it's really uh, understanding a bit about how to stabilize or further stabilize even the SIRs. Question from Emily. Uh... So uh, obviously you are also doing a lot of in silico predictions. Uh, so uh, how good are these in silico predictions? Uh, and uh, how good does it help you to narrowing down the uh, modifications of the ASO design? Yeah, so there is. There are quite a few uh, sequence motifs that we avoid. And, uh, and then through um, machine learning, also understand uh, the designs that um, are likely to be um, very well um, safe and received well by the in vivo models, as well as the uh, pro-inflammatory models. So all of that goes into the front end. What it does is it reduces the number of molecules that you necessarily are testing, and it ups the a uh, number of molecules that then ultimately are productive, potent, safe. So that gives you obviously more choices uh, at the back end. But even with all of the in silico, we're still looking at in excess of a thousand ASOs uh, for any given uh, target. So it's uh, you know it's still a pretty pretty big. Pretty big lift. Although you can you can screen a thousand of these ASOs in a few weeks. So that's quite a bit. One thousand early goes. Okay. <laughs> Many of the viewers do not screen one thousand for one target. <laughs> okay. Um, about uh, uh, incorporating the mesophosphoramide, uh, is are these already in clinical trials? Uh, and can it uh, used as a direct replacement for the phosphotyrate bonds? Yeah, the measles will move into clinical uh, studies this year. Have not yet. Okay, they're ongoing. In, they're, in talks. they're in talks. So, uh, another question about uh, chemistry. Eplotursin uh, uh, has uh, less PS than the inotursin. Uh, so, uh, is there any explanation why uh, a few less uh, PS uh, made this big difference? Yeah, we've been able to show in preclinical and in vitro human assays that taking uh, some of that nonspecific protein binding out of the molecule actually improves its pro-inflammatory uh, response. So binding to cells, binding to proteins that may interact with the immune system, um, taking out the phosphorothioates can make a big difference. Question from Tracy. So uh, about the neurology programs, uh, is there a focus on targeting specific brain regions or specific brain cells in the brain, or do you prefer a broad distribution? Or that's my own uh, ad, uh, does it depend per disorder, per disease? Yes, it does depend on the disorder. Um, broad distribution gives us a greater opportunity to, you know, tackle more diseases. Um, but at the same time, if you find that there's a particularly hot spot, hot cell type that uh, is very easy to tackle at lower doses, it's another opportunity. So I, I think both are important. Um, and uh, so 
broad broad is probably preferred okay a question from alexander uh it's uh more about the entire program uh uh, uh, a question related to the timing of a therapeutic program. Uh, I've seen the number 12 to 18 months for IND submissions shared by several uh, actors in the field. When does one start counting? Is it from the screening phase? Is it from the start of the non-TLP talks? Is it from the CMC synthesis? So, uh, It starts when the drug goes to manufacturing. So it's it's after all of the screening, it's after all of the preclinical, it's upon the identification of the molecule. It gets approved at RMC, then it goes over to manufacturing. So that's where it starts. The clock starts there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, I have uh, also, uh, so I have a uh, uh, a career uh, question. Uh, from Mark Atwan. I think that's also uh, also good to have. Uh, what's your opinion about PhD students who want to do research in industry? Should they consider doing a postdoc, either in academia or industry, or should they consider going directly into industry to gain experience that way? So a little bit of career advice from your side. Hmm. Well, I, I think it depends on where you're going. The... the um... I, th I think the academic uh, situation is so much stronger today than it was when I started here. Um, there was very little bit of, uh, there was a little bit of chemistry happening in academia. There was quite a bit happening at some of the companies. Um, and I think one of the reasons OTS was uh, actually formed was to encourage more academics, more of that research. Uh, and, and I think it's been very, very healthy, and we've begun to build a very strong. So it depends on where you're going. You know, there are some very good labs that would be a great place to do a postdoc and uh, get that experience. And uh, if the if the opportunity is there in one of the stronger uh, biotechs that has a really strong medicinal chemistry group, that too would be an option. Yes. Question on uh, the uh, uh, HO development for ultra rare patients. I think you already showed the uh, differences in patient populations from a few 500 patients up to millions of uh, of patients. So, uh, uh, is Iona still interested in, in investing in the NS1 diseases uh, like Tim Yu and uh, Milasa? Yeah, interesting question. N of one, the way that we're you know, involved in N of one uh, would be in combination with uh, something like an ALS uh, portfolio, <clears throat> where maybe you have, <clears throat> excuse me, a broad, let me get a drink here, maybe you have a broad um, program in a particular disease and some very rare subtypes. Um, there, I think it would be very interesting, but for uh, the way we have evolved today, uh, the end of one, if we find it and it's and it looks good, uh, we'd like to pass it along to uh, end of one consortium or end lorem or one of the groups that is uh, really better suited at uh, finding a home for a single patient. Yes. Uh, so we are already two minutes past the hour, so, but we have still a lot of questions. Is it okay if we take five extra minutes? Is I'm good. Five? Five. Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Then uh, we just continue with it because it might be nice if we can answer as many questions as uh, as possible. So thank you for the uh, for the extra time that we uh, that we take. Uh, so from a, a non clinical point of view, are the uh, package specific? For each uh, new drug, or can you cross refer to particular tox studies? So, do you any comments on that? Yeah, by and large, it's two species. Um, to get into a single ascending or a pretty simple phase one, it's three months of dosing. 
in a rodent and a non-rodent species. And the non-rodent species of particular choice is the monkey. And uh, preclinically, the rodent is usually mouse. So the two M's, that's pretty, pretty standard. So, so, so there are some uh, uh, advantages. So, some, some, some left also moving away from uh, the tox studies in animals, especially for the smaller animals. So, do you think this is already? Uh, what's the status of that? It's already applicable, or we should wait for another few years, or uh, we can never use these uh, IPS or patient-derived cells uh, for these kind of studies. What's your feeling about that? Yeah, it, it's really interesting that it, it, it's really driven by the regulatory agencies, unfortunately. And, and today, uh, FDA holds to two species and in vivo species. And the uh, if we're just talking about Europe, one species non-rodent works just fine. Okay. Thanks. So ultimately, uh, where do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the <laughs> on the country or on the yeah. the place in the world you, you live. Yeah. Uh, so a question from Lee. Uh, so what conjugate chemistries do you feel have the greatest potential for future targeted delivery? Lipids, peptides. Well, I think it's going to be the peptides. What we're seeing, at least today, uh, is the uh, the peptides greatly out uh, outperform and can easily be developed to um, to outperform like the proteins. And certainly, the only carbohydrate that, that I know of that does a really good job of targeting is the galnac for the hepatocyte. Question for Michael. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's difficult to manufacture uh, the oligo. So how often does manufacturability drive the research programs? So what can you not do because the limits of the chemistry? Boy, I should have one of my manufacturing guys on for this one. But uh, I can tell you what they say. It's going to be hard, and then they do it. <laughs> So I don't know. They they perform miracles. I haven't found anything that they can't do. Also for the large scale. I'm for sorry. Large, also for the larger scale. Also for the larger scale. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's always on the small scale. All I hear is, "Oh, it's easy," and then uh, it's thrown over to manufacturing. And what I hear is. This is probably not possible, and then it is. <laughs> so. Okay, I have a good one for you. To uh, you might want to, to give a little bit of advice. So, what conferences or meetings would you suggest for scientists new in the field to attend? Well, OTS is number one. I would say for for individuals new in the field, there's opportunities uh, to learn from the basics up. And you'll hear all of the cutting edge research that's being done. And, and a very wide modality. So don't forget to sign up for the OTS meeting in October in Montreal. Love to see all of you there. Um, other oligo meetings, uh, you, if you're more on the manufacturing side of things, the tides meetings are quite good. Tides are oligonucleotides and peptides. So, you know, you get a broad swath there. I really can't think of, then of course, there's all the therapeutic meetings where maybe the, the latest antisense or SI is being presented or even, even uh, you know, an editing, a DNA editing tool is being presented. And um, I think it's a little more limited but um, obviously that's where you're learning about um, the first, at, for the first time, what the clinical uh, data is looking like. Okay. Uh, so we still have a lot and a lot of questions. So, uh, so uh, asking the questions, 
I cannot keep up, keep up with all the new questions. So I think uh, we do uh, two more. And then if there are any further questions, uh, you can send them, I think, to info at oligotherapeutics.org. Oh, is that correct, Aaron? <laughs> Yeah, okay, Aaron said. We can edit in the in the chat if there are any. Uh, then, then we can forward them to uh, to Richard, and then you might get an answer on the on these as well. Because uh, otherwise, we can stay here uh, for uh, for one more hour. So, a few more questions. Um, uh, for the in silico predictions, uh, uh, the predictions for which ones are uh, further developed or more valuable: the SI RNA predictions or the ASO predictions. And why? Hmm. Well, I don't know that I have an answer for you. SIRNA is relatively new for us. I can tell you for the ASOs, um, with the exception of allele specific, um, you know, really finding a good oligo that is allele specific, I think with the exception of that, We've we've uh, never failed to find a good oligo, um, so I I guess that's that's kind of the answer, and I think that SI is going to be the same. Okay, um, and I think this will be the last question because then we will finish up. Uh, so, do you have any idea or any clue uh, or any data? Uh, how often a patient can be treated with an ASO and for uh, what time period would it be helpful? Mm. So, um, you know, we're always moving to less and less frequent dosing. So um, I think that's always a good, a good move. I think once, once monthly is very well, um, very well tolerated. Um, our experience to date is out to like five years um, of once monthly dosing. Uh, again, very well tolerated and, and very safe. Um, so it doesn't, I mean, it looks like we have the opportunity to do uh, chronic lifetime dosing with these, uh, with these safe uh, ASOs. Um, you know, in our uh, Spinraza program with intrathecal dosing every four months, I think we're out to as far as uh, almost 10 years now in some patients. And then one final question from my side. So it's exactly the other way around. So when would you start treating a patient? Are there any... Uh, what kind of biomarkers or what kind of uh, as soon as possible when they are adults? Any ideas on that? And of course, I can imagine that it also depends on the disorder and the targets and those kind of things. It really depends on the disorder, but we can give you a few examples. For neurodegenerative disease, which uh, begins in childhood, the earlier the better. Uh, so with Spinraza, being able to treat before symptom onset can result in patients who do not actually develop symptoms. So that's a huge um, advantage to early. Um, in other diseases like um, hereditary angioedema, for example, um, kids will start to exhibit um, issues with, um, with, with the edema uh, and the attacks and uh, they should be treated when they start to exhibit these. And sometimes they don't exhibit them until they're in their teenage years, um, generally not before that, probably because of some, some interaction with the hormonal uh, components of um, development. In any case, it does very well depend on uh, the indication. And um, in Europe, you know, we have to make a case and justify when do we start dosing. And they're always pushing for earlier. So pediatric plans are put in place for every every product. Cool. Thank you very much. I think I give the word to Erin. Great. Well, thank you, Richard, again, for an amazing talk. So many of the comments 
were just reiterating that and saying it was it's really cool research, really informative. Um, and obviously we had a lot of enthusiasm. So I just want to, again, say what Ronald um, mentioned. There's other ways to get in, in contact with Richard if you have questions to follow up. Um, and we want to thank you again very much um, for this wonderful talk and, and very engaging session. Um, we'd like to remind the participants that the session is recorded, so you can share it with your colleagues. You can re-watch it to try to maybe get some answers to your questions if you missed something. Um, also, we have more webinars coming up, one in late April, so you can keep checking back on the webinars page um, to see what is coming up there. And just one more time, thank you so much, Richard, for such a wonderful session.